Tampa City Council meeting for November 22nd, 2021 to order. Ms. Hunt, would you take the roll? Mr. Carter? Present. Mr. Young? Here. Mr. Walters? Here. Ms. Cleland McGrath? Here. Ms. Moulton? Here. Mr. McDougall? Here. Mr. Miller? Here. Thank you. Thank you. Would you all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? This evening, we're going to amend the agenda at, to add item AA, an executive session to discuss a potential litigation or litigation as allowed by RCW 42.30.1101I. This will be at the end of all the other agenda items when we enter in the executive session. And the city attorney will be with us and we will take no action this evening the executive session will um, last approximately 30 minutes. And at the conclusion of the executive session, uh, we'll come back in, a bit, well, no, we won't to, the, the regular meeting will be adjourned at that time with no action taken this evening. The other item I need to add this evening is item F under announcements and committee reports. I will be do, doing a mayor's award of merit this evening. So item 3A is where I'm gonna go now, and that is our COVID-19 update for today. As of this week, the state of Washington reports 762,118 cases of COVID, 9,110 deaths throughout the pandemic. In the state, 71.7% .7 of those ages 12 and older have been fully vaccinated. In Skagit County, We've had a total of 12,477 COVID cases. We've had 126 fatalities and 710 people have been hospitalized. In Skagit County, the fairgrounds will be closed this Friday and Saturday due to the holiday, excuse me, Thursday and Friday due to the holiday. Also at the fairgrounds, testing and vaccines will close permanently after January 28th and we, they urge everyone to use their local providers for those services. As of last week, the county reported a case rate of 712 per 100,000 over the previous 14 days and a hospitalization rate of 19.2 COVID cases per 100,000 for the previous seven days. I might note that that's the highest numbers we've seen since COVID began and the Delta variant has has been alive and well in our county. 196,065 vaccine doses have been administered in Skagit County to date, and 69.8% of those ages 12 and older in Skagit County are fully vaccinated. The Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine is available for children ages five to 11 at Skagit Valley Fairgrounds by appointment only. Booster doses are also available at the fairgrounds by appointment only. Free antigen testing is limited to those who are currently symptomatic or have had a recent exposure. And I'll close tonight's report with just asking everyone in the community to be safe over this Thanksgiving weekend. Enjoy being with family and friends, but please follow good protocols, wear your mask, hand washing, and keep your family and loved ones safe during, through this epidemic. Thank you very much. Council, any comments? May I give? Mr. Young. Uh, yes, I, I, I did notice that um, once before it was a, a little bit more disaggregate breakdown of vaccinated versus unvaccinated. And from doing a little bit of research myself, I'm finding that because we're a small city, that the fear is that it will separate people who we may know without even missing their names. So I guess I was just hoping that uh, if we would not be in any violation, that that would drive home the point of urgency of vaccination, yeah. um, given that from my research, it's um, largely unvaccinated, but there are those that across 
that are crossing over to um, being having the virus even after being vaccinated. So I just I guess I just wanted to drive that point of urgency home. Personally, I know of two people um, from my hometown uh, that died of the uh, virus within the last week, and neither of them were vaccinated. So Thank I just you. think so that's important. Thank you, Mr. Young. I don't have those specifics this evening, but what I have been told over and over again by the health department and Island Hospital is that about vaccinated people, there's about a 10% breakthrough. They can get cases, they can get COVID, but the majority of the COVID cases are people that are unvaccinated at this time. I don't have any statistics this evening. No, so. the point is that it was just so sad because so many um, people are dying and the virus is still running rampant. And um, so there are some things that we can do. So I'm just echoing what you said. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, we'll move on then to item 3B, our finance committee report. Mayor here. Mr. Walters. Finance committee met last week. We talked about uh, just a couple of things here. Uh, first of all, we spoke briefly about the need to re-up our emergency declaration and resolution. Over time, we have eliminated sections from that resolution, so there's really almost only one thing left in it, and that is the provision allowing for remote attendance for meetings. Um, the opinion of the committee was, let's bring that back to council and make a decision on how that should go. Uh, we discussed it before, we didn't make a decision. Um, let's just bring it back and, and get it resolved. Um, waste management had asked for a change in the uh, inflation adjustment value in their contract. Uh, we had delayed action on that. They would like to come back and pitch us their contract mod. We said, fine, come, come pitch it. Don't make us pitch it for you. Um, we spent quite a bit of time talking about fiber financing, looking at the future. Um, of how the fiber system will be financed for the build out, but then ongoing operational expenses, um, how we're gonna pay for that debt service, how we're gonna cover the cash flow. All of that assumes a 2024 completion and a rollover of our line of credit into a bond. Um, but still looking at the numbers and considering our desire that fiber start paying back the taxpayer, not just paying off its um, build out expense. Uh, we do expect that there will need to be more aggressive savings in the fine, uh, fiber department um, than perhaps the fiber department is projecting or predicting or proposing at this point. Um, and ultimately we'll have to have a larger discussion about that at council. We talked about the uh, ladder truck for the fire department. Um, we are guaranteed the loan for that and we're looking at about $300,000 of savings. It's 10% it's and then another 10%. If we pay for it all at once and order it before the end of this year. Um, so we wanted to know if um, there was anything we needed to do to get ready for that. And there might be um, because we might want to borrow internally to pay for the truck before um, we execute the loan with the state, the low interest loan that helps pay, that pays for the truck. Um, and then Mr. Hoagland did note a correction from the previous council meeting where we discussed it, that we, we have encumbered 100K of the fire impact fees for the design work for station three. So there's a little less of the impact fees available than uh, he'd previously noted. Right, That's all we you. got. Any additions? All right, we'll move on to item 3C, our Housing Affordability and Community Services Committee report. Yeah, Mayor Gare. Ms. Cleveland. Thank you. Actually, we don't have much, many notes from the meeting we had earlier this last Thursday. Um, we were just kind of brainstorming how we will kind of collect all of the information we've worked on on the, the many, many meetings we've had with various stakeholders within the community and within the county and the region, um, and we are hoping to put together a presentation to make to the rest of council and the public about what our findings are and kind of our plan moving forward. So we are just doing a little bit of a study session in that manner. Thank you. 
And then we have the item B, which is our Park and Recreation Committee report. Mayor Gear? Ms. Molson. Thank you. The Parks Committee meets quarterly and we met last week. It was um, City Parks and Rec staff and me and we had a lot to talk about. One of the things being a resolution that will come to council in December for the renaming of N Avenue Park to honor the Samish people and, and name it after a traditional site there. That's been reviewed by the city attorney and the tribal council and that will be coming to us soon. We talked about the Coslin Park Memorial Wall and our lack of a policy on memorials. And so the Parks and Rec Advisory Commission and the Museum Advisory Board are working on that. So we have regulations moving forward. We spoke about the skate park and I think most people probably know the really exciting news there is that there was a $500,000 anonymous donation toward the skate park another $100,000 from the Kiwanis Noon Club via the Anacortes Parks Foundation, and the Anacortes Skates Group has raised $50,000 on their own. So council at some point will be asked for some money for things like infrastructure such as parking and stormwater issues, that fund those fundamental things that we do so well here with Public Works. Um, so sort of in-kind donation. And then, so that's, that's really super exciting. We talked about the senior center that is going along very well. The kitchen served 70 plus people at a holiday dinner last week in two different seatings for COVID safety. And there's music back, there's been ukulele lessons, tech support, basket weaving, and the, the senior center is also going to participate in the winter wonderland walk and the gingerbread decorating at the transit shed coming oh, up in December. So everyone's really excited to be back. They're about half to two thirds of what they were as far as participation prior to COVID. So everybody's feeling really excited about that. They also had help with, the seniors got help from community action with utility assistance for the winter. And there was one-on-one -on -one counseling for 24 people who were able to get in touch with help for their utilities. They also got a new camera through a donation from the, the foundation, Senior Center Foundation, to make remote meetings a little more natural feeling. It's got a 360 degree microphone and a camera, so it'll help people feel a little bit more connected in those, in those venues and those meetings. After the Senior Center, we talked about the forest lands and the Forest Advisory Board is at long last going to start talking about motorized bicycles and have that conversation and involve different stakeholders and participants in those conversations and also talk to other jurisdictions who have faced this question before, such as Bellingham, for example, places that allow it, places that don't, what the results have been. The Cap Santa Trail that the Parks Board approved the route last week, which is basically, or I don't know if it was last week actually, but it was recent. They're going to fine tune the existing route from the gazebo up to the top and make that more accessible for people. So that's in conjunction with, is it Kiwanis that's doing that? I th Rotary. Okay, I apologize for that, the Rotary. <laughs> <laughs> and they're working on the permit to close trail 132, the one that's adjacent to Little Cranberry Lake that's eroding. There was a work party on Saturday in the ACFL. I haven't heard the results of that. And then as far as the recreation department, we'll be seeing the Anacortes Waterfront Alliance contract soon for 2022. They had a record number of soccer participants this year. They had over 500 kids and 50 teams. So that was fabulous. Um, the Haunted Forest on Halloween was a smashing success, as was the Mount Erie Dallas Cloakey Trail Run that happened again this year. So things are going great at Parks and Rec. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. That was wonderful. What a great report. So a planning committee report. Item E. Mayor Gear. Ms. Cleveland McGrath. Thank you. So uh, at five o'clock today, we met with the planning committee. Um, Mr. Walters and Ms. Ms. Uh, Moulton and I were there. Um, so we talked, we kind of just 
talked about of a, a number of issues. Um, Shoreline's master plan, there's probably gonna be one more public comment period at the planning commission level. There is a tweak to it um, with the shoreline and the, the adjacent zoning that they wanna make sure that the public understands and is able to comment on. Um, we talked a little bit about how we are, want to integrate uh, the shoreline master plan with the Title 19 development regulations and the comprehensive plan that exists, exists for the city and to make it a little bit more user friendly. Um, right now it's kind of the shoreline master plan is this big stack of um, plan that doesn't quite fit in and it's, it, it, it's, it's not user friendly. So um, Libby and uh, Don are working on a couple different options that will be pre presented to planning commission and then probably want to say early January and then it should come to count city council um, in the first quarter of 2022. Uh, we talked a little bit about the Wilson Hotel, um, which, is, which is operated by the Housing Authority. Um, there is an outstanding loan um, and there's an opportunity for us to possibly just forgive that loan, which would free up some um, funds for the Housing Authority to do some reinvestment and updating within their portfolio of um, properties. Uh, so that probably will come up in front of council in the future. Um, you know, some exciting things about the planning department website on our on the city site. It's a little more user friendly, so go check it out. Um, also, they now have an Instagram account. I haven't checked it out, but I've heard good things. Um, and then we, the housing action plan, um, we were awarded the grant to work on a housing action plan for 2022. Um, we are in discussion with a consulting firm um, and that the scope of work we're hoping will actually kind of be run through so we have a good understanding, not only through planning commission, the planning committee, but also have give council the opportunity to make any comments about kind of what direction we wanna see. Um, we wanna make sure that we have several workshops with the public. We wanna do some joint meetings with planning commission and council. Um, really talk about information and education when it comes to understanding what it takes to have a housing plan and the importance of um, the different components. Uh, so that should come, a contract should come within the next month or so, and then we'll get started on it. So we're hoping to get that accomplished within 2022. And that's about it. Thank you. Any other comments on any of those items? So at this time, I'm gonna to move to item 8F, and I'm going to do a Mayor's Award of Merit and we've had very few of these during COVID and the pandemic. I think everyone was working hard, not thinking about um, awarding people or recognizing people. And a, a few months back, I, I said to the supervisors, I haven't heard from anybody. You know, there has to be some real stand up employees, things that have gone, people have gone above and beyond. So the first letter I got was from Tim Holman in the Public Works Department, and he nominated Stephen Lang, who has worked for the city for well over two decades. And in his letter to me, he said that, you know, Steve's greatest um, ability in the community is his can-do approach to problem solving. There is, he's never taken on a public works project that he didn't think could be accomplished. He also was the successful project manager of our Ship Harbor Roundabout out there below Clear Ridge, and that he resulted, um, that project came in on time and under budget um, and that was done during those early days of COVID. Um, his administration, the federal funding, including um, the contract that was recognized by the funding agencies. So they were very um, complimentary of Steve's ability to manage that. He's also been responsible and done a very transparent job of administering funds that re resulted in the city being approached by WASDOT with an offer of an additional 600,000 in grant funding for the 32nd and M Avenue roundabout that will be coming our way. So that was directly because of Steve's really incredible work. Um, this was unsolicited and unprecedented. This offer came directly from the state based on Mr. Lang's reputation. He's a valued member of the city of Anacortes and for these reasons and many more, I am pleased to select Stephen Lang, the mayor's award of merit 
I do have a plaque that I'll be presenting to him in the next couple days. And he also, he'll also, his name will go on the wall in the hall with other employees that over the years have done, done above and beyond. And when an employee does receive uh, this award, they also get a $75 gift certificate to a restaurant of their choice. So we also also help the downtown restaurateurs during honoring our employees. So Mr. Lang couldn't be with us tonight, but I want to honor him and thank him on behalf of the city. And um, he's an incredible employee. And he's just, um, he's one of over 220 employees and they all come here to serve us well, day after day. All right, well at this time, we'll move on to public comment. And if there's anyone here in the council chambers or attending remotely, if you'd like to talk to the council about anything that is not on the agenda, it's your opportunity to come up at this time. Yes, come on up. And then if you're in remotely attending, if you'll raise your hand, I'll call on you in a bit. Good evening, Mayor, here, and members of City Council. I've been here one other time before. My name is Steve Charvat, and I'm a new resident of Anacortes, currently renting an old town, but my new, soon-to-be-built permanent house at my permanent address will be at 2411 27th Street, and I will have written comment, my written testimony to provide to this clerk. My husband and I recently moved, relocated to Anacortes last March from Seattle, full of excitement, an eager anticipation of settling down in this community while building our future dream retirement home um, within the city boundaries, being able to both simultaneously serve the community and volunteer in the community, as well as enjoy all the services and amenities that a small community such as Anacortes does offer. I come to you tonight to bring awareness to our city leaders of my experience recently with my city government and to all you as policymakers aware of an issue that has frustrated me and perhaps many silent other citizens as to the transparency of some services as it relates to citizens who are willing to invest their life hard-earned capital in the community only to be led astray as they are being asked um, actively developing uh, a project within the building process. Now having the opportunity to, um, to build our home originally in the Deception Shores gated community in unincorporated Skagit County, south of town, we made a conscious decision last year to sell that property and instead move into the incorporated city of Anacortes. Excuse me. One of the main factors that influenced our decision was the ability to build our custom home, single family home here in the city, was the fact that we would not have to install and permit an expensive fire sprinkler system in our home. Before I go on, I'd like to explain that I currently am a full supporter of community, family, and home preparedness. I'm currently the emergency management director for the city, for, excuse me, for the University of Washington system, a member of the National Fire Protection Association for over 20 years, and a proponent of safety throughout the community. That being said, I did conduct some extensive research into the various public-facing websites and reading news articles, including an article from the January Anacortes American that headline is, Anacortes City Council adopts fire code update without sprinkler requirement. Well, we purchased a new lot on 27th Street. Street. We fell in love with the lot, which by the way, adjacently, abuts adjacent to the Anacortes community forest lands. We fell in love with that lot. In fact, half of our property actually is undeveloped. We cannot develop it. 110 feet of it is within the wetland buffer. So we, in fact, own land, but leave it untouched to the, so that Mother Nature and the citizens can enjoy that property. That being said, I want to make you aware that the city's current building permit does indeed require people to install an expensive, in our case, ten dollars to $12,000 fire sprinkler system in our home. I've spoken and corresponded with a number of uh, city officials, including from the building department and the fire department on this issue. While they both pointed to indirect references to the International Fire Code and the Washington State Fire and Building Codes, um, both of which only are partially adopted by the City Council, 
earlier this year, there remain a number of loopholes in which the city does indeed mandate fire, expensive fire sprinkler systems in new home construction. Now, one requirement of that is the overall square footage, which I'm not arguing. It does require that the closest fire hydrant provide a minimum flow of minimum water flow. The test by a certified water testing firm must be completed to show that the closest hydrant provides for 1,750 gallons per minute. Sorry, my glasses are fogging up. If not, it requires sprinklers. My home builder, and ultimately me as a homeowner, hired and paid over $1,000 for a certified test to be conducted this past July 23rd. I have the results of that certified test right here that show on that date it had a flow of 1,067 below the 1,750. However, the problem here though is that the two technicians on site that we paid for to conduct the certified test were not allowed to fully open the hydrant as instructed on site by city officials on that date. And I have the report here. It says, the test performed with hydrant partially closed to avoid excessive velocity in the supply main. This report pr proves 1,000 gallon per minute as and at the test itself, higher volumes at a higher pressure may be possible with the fire hydrant fully open. So my question to you is this as city officials, if the city does indeed require that this test be performed, which we did and paid for, why am I being forced to install a very expensive fire sprinkler system in my home, which is less than 500 feet from a brand new fire hydrant, um, when we're not allowed to actually successfully conduct the flow test that is required. So if we can't con conclusively provide the data to the city to prove the capacity of this hydrant, why is the city mandating this very expensive construction cost for my new home? Almost done. Finally, I'd like to make the observation of fact of mandates and transparency. No mention of square footage and fire hydrant flow requirements are anywhere on the city's website or current printed document material for building. Um, by the way, insurance rates, often said your insurance rates will go down. That is not the case. I've talked to my insurance carrier, and while they, they do like fire sprinklers in homes, it's negated by the fact that in introducing water into parts of a home that don't normally have water in them, if you have an accident or break, it has a higher risk. So they equal up. So the issue of adding sprinklers to reduce your premium is not the case. So I'm providing a copy of my testimony to the um, city clerk here. Um, so that officials are aware of what's happening with people who want to build homes and that there is indeed a sprinkler requirement. And if that remains, you need to let the people who are paying for these tests conduct the tests so they can prove one way or the other that they meet or don't meet that requirement. Currently, I cannot provide that, yet I'm still required to have a fire sprinkler permit at this time. Those are my comments. Sorry, I'm a little, I'm a little out of breath today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um for making us aware of that. And um, I personally will talk to the planning department. All right, anything else? All right, we'll move on then. Any other public comment? No other hands are up. All right, we're gonna move on to the consent agenda items 5A through D. Mayor. Mr. Young. I move we approve the consent agenda. Thank you. A second. Mr. Young and Mr. Carter. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. same sign. Motion carries. We move on now to our public hearing. And we have two continued public hearing this evening. Uh, the first one is ordinance 3099. This is for our 2022 to 2027 capital facilities plan. We'll take that item up next. The other one is our continued public hearing on our budget. So is there anyone in the audience or online that would like to comment to the council this evening on our capital facilities plan? And this has been um, out for the community to discuss, I think, for the last three or four weeks, approximately. And Council, do you have any comments on this before I close the public hearing? Oh, I do have a hand up. John Wilkinson is online. 
Go ahead, John. You turn on your mic. Thank you, Mayor Gear and members of council. Um, this question really re back since November 8th, but relative to the 2022 projects and budget, and specifically around the sewer outfall project, page 66 and 67 of your handout package <clears throat> still claims that in 2022, $30 million of the revenue will come from user fees, which would be a 400% increase in user fee mm -hmm. from the prior year, and only $4 million from grants. And that's out of a total of $46 million. But on the other hand, there's the sewer outfall project, as you're aware, is about a $20 million project. And when the neighborhood interactions happen around specific parts of the project, there's repeated assurances that even though the routing is very high cost, high impact, that don't worry, it'll be covered by FEMA. And so there seems to be a big discrepancy still in the package that says that uh, the user fees are going to pay for this project in 2022. And again, that would be a 400% increase from prior year user fees. So, so really kind of a question of okay. why this discrepancy between what we hear from the project team versus the budget team. I, I'm not sure why the discrepancy still exists, Mr. Wilkinson, but I do know that that project, if it, if it's when it when it's built, will be fully funded by FEMA. Um, it will not be funded by user fees. So um, we need to uh, correct that discrepancy in our documents. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, all right, any other comments on the capital facilities plan? Council, any comments before I close the public hearing? All right, at this time, I will close the public hearing, Ordinance 3099 on the 2022 to 2027 capital facilities plan. And I'm gonna move on now to item 6B. This is our continued public hearing on Ordinance 4000, 2022 budget. Are there any comments on the budget? from the community, either attending here or remotely. All right, I don't see any hands up or anyone. Council, any thoughts or questions before I close the public hearing? All right, at this time, I'm gonna close the public hearing or on, um, for Ordinance 4000, the 2022 budget. And now we'll move on to item seven, other, other business. And this is a discussion um, tonight with possible, well, well, no, it's an action item, excuse me, on ordinance 4001, authorizing a 1% regular property tax levy increase. Okay, so council, um, I thought, I've thought a lot about this and I thought maybe I'd offer a little, um, uh, some thoughts around this property tax increase, maybe a bigger picture to look at. Um, when I was thinking about the property tax and I was reading, we've gotten several comments online in the last day or two. And I'm not, um, I understand what the public is telling us. You know, inflation, the cost of living, everything costs more, we should watch our expenses. And all those resonate with me greatly. But also what resonates with me even more is that um, when I looked at our budget and, um, and I looked at our general fund, which is funded by property tax, sales tax, and utilities tax, and I, I culled that out of the big budget and I took fiber out of the general fund budget just to set that aside because that has to be funded either by grants or loans. So that's not gonna be funded by sales tax, property tax, or utility. We, we get down to about an $18 million budget in our general fund that is funded by utility tax, sales tax, and property tax. And every year, um, sales tax has been growing eight to 
um, utilities three to five percent, and then property tax um, in the two to three percent. And I, I met with Mr. Hoagland today, and I said, you know, you know, give me a, a, some context. He said, well, if if sales tax only grew by one percent a year, we would we would be curtailing many of our services, and the services. What I'm, I guess what I'm so passionate about is the services in the general fund are the services that I think the community depends on us most for. Uh, public safety, our police officers, fire and medic, our library, our museums, you know, our, our roads, um, uh, engineering in our facilities. But it's just those, it's, it's the quality of life and those essential services that the general fund takes care of. And it's really, it's 18 million out of that proposed $108 million budget because utilities is over 60 million. And then you add, you add our, you know, our big projects like the sewer outfall, which is at 20 to 30 million, and, or 20 million, and you have the fire engine that we're gonna get a loan for. But anyway, it really, it helped me get in perspective really what the taxes were for. So, as much as I'm sympathetic to the community's concern about it, but the same things they're concerned about, are, we have those same pressures here at the city. We are also dealing with the cost of living, our supply chain, the cost of, just everything we do is costing more, just like it is for the average citizen. So it, maybe it's philosophical, maybe it's not, but it, it's, it's this property 1% tool that we have is the one, the one tool the council has to help uh, take care of our general fund year after year. And it, you know, it, you say, well, it's only $53,000, but that's a big deal when it comes to some of our programs. So I just, um, I just wanted to share maybe that perspective that we, we, we look at it holistically and I'm not, and, and we'd be sympathetic with our voters, but seriously, you know, if, if the voters are struggling and the city, if I, I, the city is, has those same pressures. And I also think that the citizens expect the city to provide those services. And maybe we don't like, you know, property tax and sales tax in the state of Washington, but those are the tools we have to support city government. It's the only tools we have. We're not allowed to have a bake sale. We're not allowed to open a store downtown to earn extra funds. So. Um, and I really believe here in the city, we've been good stewards of the funding and we, um, and we do pay our employees, and we try to pay our employees fairly. And in the last few years, medical costs have been probably the biggest driver in our increased um, staffing costs. And, you know, th and these are all things that were brought up by citizens in the letters I've written, that have been written in, to us in the last few days. And, um, and we have tightened our belts when we have to, and we will in the future. And we did during COVID, and I know the next time there's something, whatever it is, we'll always do what we need to do to take care of our citizens. So I will be quiet at this point. And um, Mr. Hoagland, are you online? Because he wanted to. Uh, yes, Mary, thank you. If, is there, you want to talk about um, the levy and the value of homes, and maybe that was the other missing piece in understanding this property tax and how that works. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to try and um, try and clarify. I'll share my screen to, sh to show a spreadsheet I put together. Um, hopefully, hopefully it'll, it'll help. Um, property taxes are exceedingly confusing. The property tax levy system. Um, so it's there's a number of moving parts with the property tax levy, and one of those is um, the assessment. So, the, so this is looking at the last 12 years, including 2021, of what the actual property tax assessment is in the city of Anacortes, and what the actual levy is. So, the um, so the assessment of all properties within the city is 4.2 billion. Uh, and you can see how that's grown over over the years. It's we had a few years here after the the Great Recession where those assessments decreased, um, and then they started increasing and pretty rapidly from up to a, a peak of almost 12% year over year in 2019. 
and then looking at the levy, um, the levy is what is known as a budget-based levy. And what that means is the growth of the levy is based on the prior year's budget. So the way the assessment comes into it is how that levy is collected, but the, but the growth in the assessment does not affect the tax levy itself. So the tax levy amount is based on what was collected last year. So you can see, here's the growth in the assessment over the last several years. Um, these columns over here is the growth in the levy the last several years. So, and that runs, <clears throat> it's run generally between about 1.5% and a couple of years, it was up to 2.9%. And that's made up of two parts. And that's, that's looking at year over year growth. And that's made up of two parts. The one part is the 1% property tax increase. And that's uh, each of these years illustrated that 1% has been taken by city council. And the rest of it is made up by new construction added to the tax rolls. So the growth, like looking at 2021, for example, compared to 2020, the, the difference is a 1.7% increase. So that's 1% from the tax increase from the property tax levy increase last year. The other 0.7 is from new construction added to the tax rolls. When you think of that new construction added to the tax rolls, that's new, new homes, it's new construction being built, new families moving in, <clears throat> um, and then you know those additional uh, members of the uh, of the city, um, you know, living in our town and and being part of our part of our town, but it's not. I, I don't. I don't think it's an intuitive process or an intuitive system. A few years ago, we actually had the county assessor come in and try to explain it, and and it, it still to me was uh, was very very confusing. But I, I the one takeaway I want you to have from this is <clears throat> understanding that as assessments grow, the property tax levy does not grow. So the assessment growth does not affect the levy growth. It's, they're, they're separate things. So um, hopefully this doesn't confuse things more, but I was thinking maybe an example. Um, if say property taxes, say the assessment were to go crazy next year and it increased by 50%. So the new assessment would be 6.3 billion. And, and say there's no other growth, the levy, the 1% is not taken, there's no new construction. So that same $5.3 million levy <clears throat> would, be, uh, would be collected. So the levy growth, levy growth would be zero. The assessment growth would be 50%. And what changes in that is the millage. And the millage, so the millage would drop to 85 cents per thousand from $1.27 per thousand. So what, what the millage is, is a, uh, the millage is a calculation that drives how the property tax levy is collected from the property owners. And it's millage is value per thousand dollars in assessed value. So the, the average assessment in Anacortes in 2021 for the county assessor's office was $460,000. So in our example here, next year, if the assessment grew by 50%, all things being equal, this average assessment would grow by 50% as well. So that average assessment would be $690,000. And then the tax amount, you can look at the formula here, the tax amount is in our example, $460,000 on average times $1.27 millage, that works out to $587.96 for an annual tax. So under our new example, that tax amount would be exactly the same because our levy growth was zero, even though our assessment growth was 50%. So, I hope I didn't confuse things more. I just, the message I, I wanted to try and get across was we, we all see our, those values going up really significantly, but that doesn't affect 
the growth of the tax levy that's budget based. Mayor Geer. Mr. Miller. Uh, Mr. Hoagland, that was a great explanation because it was at least far clearer than having the actual county assessor here trying to explain yeah, it. Very true. Um, because it is incredibly complex. But I think if you go back to your uh, spreadsheet, that the levy growth would not be zero because it would include new construction. That's correct, yes. So they're, that, they're, that, that to, to try to make your, your clear, clear assessment a lot more clear, it would not be zero new construction would be uh, an increase in the in that levy yes okay. correct thank you okay so steve um would you like to bring forward the one percent property tax levy increase discussion is there anything else you'd like to present to the council sure thank you mayor um so the um the ordinance there we go. Um, so we have tonight um, an ordinance to adopt the property tax in. Sorry, ooh. that still says resolution. I'm sorry, that's actually it's actually an ordinance um, to adopt the one percent property tax increase. State law requires that the illustration be um, presented in terms of a percentage increase and a dollar amount. So for City of Anacortes this year. That dollar amount is 53857 and that's 1% over the existing levy. Uh, I think we talked about some of these things early on, uh, maybe early last month, um, but looking at the, the way that 1% works out through our tax system, that would be um, based on a $460,000 average residential assessment in 2021, that'd be a $5.88 per year increase per um, per residence, per residential assessment. Um, the ordinance is required to be, or is only required to be um, approved by a simple majority. Is there any member of the audience or people attending online that would like to comment to the council on this this evening. So I'm gonna turn it over to the council now for discussion. Mayor mm -hmm. Gear. Ms. Moulton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoagland. I also find that most recent spreadsheet that you shared showing the breakdown of the entire property tax that Anacortes property owners pay as being helpful. That for someone who's, I'm just gonna use some rough numbers here say five years ago, their property taxes were $2,000 a year. And this year they are maybe $3,000 a year. I don't have the exact numbers, but I believe they've gone up about 50%. So I definitely empathize with people who are asking questions. And I also appreciate the level of organization that has gone into the outreach to council. I really appreciate the, the citizen involvement and the asking questions and demanding answers. So thank you for participating. It's great as a council member to hear from you. Um, so I keep coming back to two things. One is that if I own a house that is, is assessed at $500,000, I will pay $5 a year more to the city of Anacortes than I paid last year. That's reasonable to me. Also, when I look at some of our staffing issues, we have still not replaced a librarian that has been cut from the budget. And the Parks Department is dipping into their cash reserves to the tune of $90,000 to pay their existing staff. We had Chief Floyd come to the meeting last week and ask for a new office, an additional officer, and someone that could be on the, the county drug task force, which we need, and we know that that staff member will cost us, I think, at least $125,000. So I want people to know that these are very real needs that the city has. We want the staffing for our people. We want our public safety. We want our parks. We want our amenities and our quality of life. This matters deeply to all of us. And we are not there. And this 
additional $53,000 is going to help us at least pay for, pay for staff, for example, pay for roads, pay for the library, all these things that we count on and that are so important to us as a community. And I believe Mr. Walters talked about it last week. If we had not taken this 1% property tax increase year to year, what we would have in our budget as income from those taxes would be far lower than it is now. I believe to the tune of $1.2 million. So just imagine what we would have to cut, what we wouldn't be able to provide to our citizens if we did not have that money. So I support this property tax increase of 1%. Mayor Gear. Mr. Young. No, I just wanted to echo um, what you said as mayor. I thought it was just so very clear in the due diligence that was placed on weighing out, do we really want another tax? And you know, the taxes are a necessary part of having the quality of life we want and providing the services that we do within this city. And as part of what makes this city so attractive in so many ways is that not only are we good stewards of the money, but it's also how we apply it to getting things done that we need as a city. And so, you know, I'm very supportive. You know, I don't necessarily like taxes, but they are a necessary tool for ensuring that quality that we have. And I wanted to comment to Mr. Hoagland, you know, to say that, you know, I'm so glad that you're head of the finance department because those numbers, as you finessed and showed us how it's done, I thought it was stellar. And lastly, to, um, you know, my colleague, um, Ms. Moulton, you know, absolutely. All of those things and services you mentioned that we need and that we're lucky to live in the city we do and having the safety that we do and the services that we do, it is a necessary thing. So I'm supportive too as well. Mayor Gear. Yes, Mr. McDougal. Um, I'm in agreement with everything Ms. Moulton and Mr. Young said, and, and thank you for making your statement as well. Um, an item I'd like to call out is, you know, that that general fund is is only $18 million as far as, uh, you know, the percentage of the actual city government, like the, the large portion of our budget is, is utilities essentially, which are funded differently. So what we're talking about here is, is police and fire and library and streets. <clears throat> and these are like the things that we all really rely on every day. And for that to, to fall behind, we're already, we're already behind on, um, you know, police staffing and fire staffing compared to our peer cities around the county in, in Whatcom and Snohomish County. So everything we can do to try to like not fall further behind, um, I mean, I'm in support of. I also wanted to point out because the property tax is decoupled from the actual property value in the way Mr. Hoagland mentioned, it looks to me like basically your property value increased 50% roughly over the last 12 years and the property tax increased 12%. So essentially like we're all winning if we look at the sense of our property value has increased a great deal more than the, the tax. So I'm in support of that. Thank you, Mr. McDougal. Uh, Mayor Gear. Ms. Cleveland. Yeah, I, I, first of all, I wanna say thank you to the number of folks who did weigh in on um, this issue. And I got phone calls, I talked to people, I got emails about it, so thank you. I think it's always really important to get feedback. Um, one of the main concerns was the fact, are, have we really done a deep dive into our budget? Have we really looked for cost savings? Are we being as um, diligent as an individual home, homeowner or person in our community would need to be? And I think, at least from my perspective, we have done a lot of cost savings. A, most of it was required because COVID hit in 2020. Um, and I think we did a very good job. I think we owe it to our directors who looked at each individual budget and made major cuts and made sacrifices, not only um, with training and with staffing, but also just projects they wanted to do. And they got really creative on how to be more efficient with less money. 
Um, so I think that that, is a, that has been an ongoing concern for council, for the mayor, and for our directors for the last not couple of years, if not longer, I would assume longer. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, so I, I wanted to speak to that first of all. The second thing, um, and Mr. McDougall um, kind of beat me to the punch, and, and the fact that it's the amount of this $5.4 million approximately is completely decoupled, as he said, from um, the increase in housing ass how, uh, assessment of value when it comes to your to the, the county's assessment. And I know we all have received some of those letters in the mail in the last couple months and seen the, the increase of our, our home values. And so that makes you really uncomfortable when we hear then council is going to do a 1% increase. So I wanna be really clear that that has, is completely separate what the 1% increase is, um, is based on the $5.4 million. They can do a one, we can do a 1% increase based on the previous year's levy. So, so, so it is a much smaller amount than when we see um, these major increases in assessment. If we don't take that 1% increase each year, we can't grab that back in future years when we realize we need more. We can't do a two or a 3% increase when we've determined three years from now that we need it. Um, this is an incremental um, increase that we can do. We've done it for a number of years in the past, um, a little over 20. And, and, I, and uh, I think that it is something that we need to continue to do um, to stay afloat. I mean, we don't, the city doesn't live in a vacuum. We are required, the cost of living expenses is applied to anything we purchase, whether it's paper, whether it's raw materials, whether it's um, our employees. And, you know, this is one small increment we can make that is allowed. And so I am in support of it. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Mayor Gare. Mr. Walters. <clears throat> um, I appreciate your effort at explaining this. We need to do much more of that on an ongoing basis, all the time, not just at budget time. Um, we need to explain how the budget works, but also how the city's revenue sources work and what our constraints are. I think just a couple other factoids that are relevant here. First of all, Anacortes gets something like 14% of the standard property tax bill here in Anacortes. And as Ms. Cleland McGrath just said, that 1% adjustment is not 1% of your tax bill. It's 1% of the total property tax revenue that Anacortes brings in. Um, as the assessor is fond of saying, and I, I, I think that this is really um, the important point. When you see your property tax bill go up, when you notice it go up, um, it's because of voted measures. It's because of things like a $90 million bond for a new high school. Um, it, it's not because of this 1% adjustment that we do every year. And, and it is not a new tax in very real sense. It, it's not even an increase because inflation is very real. And uh, many workers get a COLA, people on Social Security get a COLA, and uh, that's to deal with inflation. It's, it's a very real thing. It erodes the ability of us to spend this property tax on the services that we have to provide. And again, those services are parks and museum and library and fire and police and and all of those general government things that aren't utilities. Mr. Hoagland, next year, and I'm coming to a question for you, um, we're, we're, tell me the number of dollars we are borrowing to pay, pay for fiber build out, that we are borrowing against our line of credit. Um, we have 9.2 million budgeted for 2022 to support the fiber capital. And if we had $9.2 million extra laying around, we would spend that. It's general revenue, fibers in the general fund. So if we don't take the property tax uh, 1%, we will bill, we will, we will borrow 9.2 million plus another 50,000. And then we will pay interest on top of that. Um, because we are financing our build out with debt and it's general revenue, not utility revenue. This, this is interchangeable here. And so it, it is not an avoidable expense. It is not, it is not a problem of forecasting how, what our expenses are going to be. 
It is, it is very much um, money that, that will help us avoid interest and make things cheaper for future generations of anacortisans. So um, it's very sensible. It's, it's what we've done for 20 years, every year for 20 years. We, we take the 1% the adjustment because um, it's incumbent on us to make reasoned, rational decisions uh, on behalf of the city and behalf of the future budget. Um, if it's $50,000 next year, we could deal with no matter what, but long term, we want to be the last city in Washington State to go bankrupt, not the first. And that's where all of them, frankly, are headed under the system um, because we can't raise sales tax forever. Property tax is continually going downward, not upward, because of inflation. Something will have to change, uh, but that's up to the state government to figure out. We're just got to play the hand we're dealt. Thank you, Mr. Walters. Okay, anyone else on the council like to M Mayor weigh Deer? in? Mr. Miller. So the, the contrarian will have to speak as the person who voted against this last year, and I will vote against it again this year. Uh, the decoupling argument is, is a good argument. All the arguments are, are very good arguments, but the, the, it is not decoupled from the real property owners in Anacortes. Um, we, can, we can explain, we can have the assessor come in anytime we want, but I particularly like what Mr. Hoagland put in the agenda bill um, with an alternative action, a do not approve direct staff to revise budget to remove the 1% increase from budget to resources. Um, so a couple of possibilities would be maybe line 17, you could probably trim 10,000 off of that. Line 211, probably ten, another 10,000, that's professional services in both those areas. Line 308, line 354, line 494, uh, five, probably five, and, and those are placeholders for uh, uh, legal fees for negotiated um, uh, collective bargaining units. And that's really important to point out because we still don't know the impact of that cost in the future. So I think it's hard, it's hard to go to the taxpayers and say, we don't really know exactly what the budget is, but we definitely need this money for all the good reasons that, uh, that my fellow council members have already pointed out. So that's, that's why I'm still challenged with uh, supporting this. And especially, you know, last year, I, I think I made a more passionate argument against it because uh, the city, all the great services, uh, y you know, all of our employees were paid and, and a as they deserve to be, but uh, the residents were far more affected uh, by the economic uh, situation caused by the pandemic. So going back to them and saying we need more I, I just I just can't do it. Thank you. Okay, any other comments? Mayor Deer. Mr. Carter. I, do, I, uh, I really appreciate uh, it being explained in such easy terms for everyone to understand why we need it. Uh, and I do understand that we really do need it for the way the direction the city is going and where we need to get to. Uh, just with the pandemic and the way it was, it is, it's hard for me to ask, you know, I mean, it has gone up. It is less than inflation. I understand that. But just asking for more is just, it's hard for me. Understanding where everyone is um, and how the last two years have gone. It's just, it is really hard. And, you know, I, I want to give some kind of break, at least just as little, uh, but just a little break. It does put us back a little bit and, uh, that's just where I'm sitting. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? All right, council. We have ordinance um, 4001 in front of us this evening. Mayor here. Mr. Walter. I move approval of the ordinance as presented. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Walters and a second by Ms. Moulton to approve ordinance 4001 authorizing the 1% record regular property tax levy increase. Is there any other discussion? Ms. Hunt, would you call for the vote? Mr. Young? Yes. Mr. Walters? Yes. Ms. Cleveland McGrath? Yes. Ms. Moulton? Yes. Mr. McDougall? Yes. 
Mr. Miller? No. Mr. Carter? Yeah. Sorry, no. Motion carries, five to two. Thank you. Great discussion tonight. Thank you all. All right, at this time, we're gonna move on to item 7B, which is open for public comment. And this is ordinance 3099, our 2022 to 2027 capital facilities plan. Um, and we'll go from there. And we'll also be, oh, and then we're also gonna um, do ordinance 4000 as far as the budget. So. Steve, do you want to introduce this? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> um, and thank you for pointing out the uh, both ordinances on the same line of business on the agenda. I know it's a little bit unusual, but we um, we do work these two budgets, the CFP and the annual budget, uh, in conjunction with each other. So it's we feel it's appropriate to adopt both at the same time. Um, so I put together some, I should say, we had uh, a lot of help putting together some summary charts and information um, for council. Um, and I'd be happy to uh, go through any of that with you or answer any questions that, that you might have. Um, I, I think we started last week with um, some discussion about the budget and I was hoping that could continue tonight and get any, any issues fleshed out that might still be out there. Well, we could go down the dais, and then if anyone has something they want to throw on the table, we could do that. Mr. Walters? I put a number of those things on the table at the last meeting. Um, facility projects I wanted to discuss in depth. One of those facility projects is $300,000 or so, I guess, uh, to replace the elevator in City Hall. Also, I think that there have been a number of uh, changes to the capital facilities plan draft, but I don't think we have that in front of us. Um, so, do we, the, have, do we have that, Steve? Yeah, that's a fair point, actually. I ended up recycling the um, the original draft uh, in the packet tonight. I apologize. The, <clears throat> the, the summary charts that are in there are based on the new figures, but the total packet that's in there is uh, the original draft and is, is outdated now. Um, <clears throat> if you can indulge me, perhaps we can come back on the uh, 7th, the 6th, and um, we can put together uh, a summary, summary of changes um, in the CFP and then double check some of these issues that have been brought up during comment as, as well. Um, but I guess I, I did want to tie down the um, some of the specifics that okay. you wanted to review. So, the so we'll, we'll go down and everyone will, will, will make sure we get that on the list. What else do you have? Anything else? Uh, I, the other things I have, I listed in our last meeting. Okay. I don't necessarily have those in okay. front of me at That's the moment. Fine. But um, it, w it will, I imagine, take staff a little bit of time uh, to pull those up, prepare that. Um, I don't think that they could have gotten it in the packet for this week based on hearing about it last okay. Monday. Okay. Uh, but maybe the 7th is what I heard Mr. Hoagland say yeah. because we don't have a meeting on um, next Monday because it's the 5th Monday. Um, I, I think that we also ought to set a target for final adoption of the budget. Um, and maybe we give ourselves time off on December 27th. Is that, is that something that we're interested in entertaining? Because for myself, uh, December 27th um, is a, only a fourth Monday. We'd ordinarily be, be meeting, I guess, but that would give us three more yeah. weeks to finish so up the budget. So my only thought on the 27th that maybe a kind of a night we could have some um, swearing in and some transition it could be a celebratory meeting if we were available on that day. And if we, not, we could not do that. Well, and we could also, I mean, that might be up to Mr. Miller, really, but we could also schedule that for any night of the week. Right. Um, That's true, too. So I think that was what I, my 
originally when I thought I was hoping we'd have all our work done and it'd be a night for sort of welcome mat and for me to say goodbye and that kind of thing. Mayor Gear, an opportunity for you to say goodbye. I would like to make sure that you have that opportunity. So for me, I can you know, get sworn in in Steve's office. That, that's, that's okay by me. Oh, it's, it's a pretty big deal. Let's just not combine either of those with the budget. Okay, yeah, yeah. we're going to keep all that separate. So, all right, so back to the, what's at hand here. All right, so we've got what you, you said last week. We'd like to get this done sooner than later. Yes. I'm going to turn it over to you, Christine. Sure. Uh, put on the hot seat. Uh, so I had, and I, this is, I've got some notes probably um, uh, for S Mr. Hoagland. Uh, so one thing that came to my attention th this last week was the Guimas Channel Trail. There is, in the Capital Facilities Plan, quite a large amount of money um, in a couple years reserved. And I got some questions regarding what the what kind of the deeper details are. Is that for planning? Is that for purchasing? Is that for actually the construction of it? Um, that was one thing that I'd like to hear more about. Um, and I've got a couple others that I will send to you. Um, I just it would be nice to kind of have some of those changes tracked for that December seventh meeting. So that's all I've got for now. Okay. Carolyn, thank you. I had a meeting with Mr. Hoagland last week and he cleared up some questions that I had. Um, I have one about, a, to do with the Guimas Channel Trail, also the, the sewer line from Leverick to 6th Street. And, and it's way out in 2027 for $9 million, but maybe a little bit of a review of that. Um, and that's all I have for the moment. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I had notes from last week, but I don't have them with me. And I think some of my concerns were, were just, uh, besides the history piece, which is not a huge deal, but really the how we're funding some of the, how we're funding some of the things. I think that, uh, you had some listed as grants and some listed as income. It, it, was, it was fairly confusing, and I think it's really important to kind of lay out, especially for some of those big projects, that this is being funded with grants versus user fees. Or, or it, it had to do with that, and I think uh, I'll, I'll find that note, those notes and, and make sure you have those, Steve. Okay. Um, Ann Finney. I'm trying, yeah. No. Thank you. Um, I've verified much of what I was concerned about, and you have um, explained um, parts that I had questions on, so I'm very much satisfied. I just sort of echoed the questions that are coming out of the fellow council members, but, you know, I'm okay with moving forward. Okay. How about you, Bruce? Uh, I, I think I had a similar list to Mr. Walters and Mr. Miller, just a, primarily some cleanup items. Um, where funding source is in the wrong table, say, or like the packet um, Steve mentioned. I did have a quick question, though, Mr. Hoagland, um, and it's a little bit related to the previous discussion. The utility tax stream that goes into the general fund, that's paid by ratepayers. Do the wholesale partners, wholesale customers also pay that utility tax, like the refineries or City of LaConnor, City of Oak Harbor? Yeah, yes, good question. Um, utility tax is another one that's um, a little bit confusing. Um, and so there's um, there's two two parts to the utility tax. There's the utility tax on private utilities, which is uh, electricity, natural gas, um, cable TV, and telephone service. And then a utility tax on, and those, those are dictated by um, either state or federal law. And I think I think TV is at 7% and the rest are at 6%. Okay. The and then there's public utility tax, which is on the city's utilities, water, sewer, storm, solid waste. And those are di dictated by council action. And those are 7% um, mm -hmm. except for um, the solid waste is at 12%. And the solid waste, <clears throat> uh, this goes back several years to where 
the transportation or toward the uh, pavement management program was put into place, that's um, that utility tax is split between the, the road maintenance fund and the general fund. Um, but getting back to your to your question, those are um, those are charged. The utility tax is charged to the industrial customers, the refineries, um, and to residential and commercial customers. However, they are currently not charged to the other wholesale customers. So the water we sell to the other entities that are water purveyors that resell their water to their customers. So that's City of Oak Harbor, LaConnor, PUD, and the uh, Swinomish. Those entities are not charged utility tax. And that kind of goes back to um, the history of that tax. Um, there, it used to be unallowable to charge those types of entities utility tax. There was a change in the law several years ago that does allow that, but um, we have that same language written into our contracts with our wholesale customers that we would not charge that tax. So in order to apply that tax to the other wholesale customers, we would have to update our contracts. Mm -hmm. So that's um, kind of a long answer, hopefully not too confusing, but. Um, no, thank you. That that clarifies. I mean, that that's potentially a revenue stream that we could have some control over, but it sounds like due to from previous contracts, we actually um, ceded that control essentially, or ceded that potential revenue stream. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. So those contracts would have to yeah. be reworked. Just so folks understand, like we we are constrained in the kinds of ways we can access revenue, and and that one right there was one where we didn't necessarily need to, uh, like that's a self-constraint we, we gave ourselves. And, and I, I would point out also that 7% is a big number, but we do, uh, we are required to pass on 5.029% of that to the state. So the majority of that utility tax that we're collecting from our customers gets passed on to the state of Washington. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, Mr. Carter. Any thoughts or questions on the capital facilities plan? I just have a quick question on your the CFP charts on the summary of the revenue types. Where are the grants coming from? Are those the ones that we've talked about before in our meetings? On the first page, second paragraph. Yeah, here, let me share my screen, make sure we're on the um, same page. So the this is the, the CFP charts. Um, this line right here, this this grant line here is what we're talking about. Right. So um, Sorry, it's, the only one that comes to mind right off the bat is in 2024, I believe we have 20 million budgeted in grants towards the um, community center. Um, I'll have to go back to the source documents still for these uh, figures in 2025 and 2026. I don't remember what those are off the top of my head. Uh, I can do that as we're, as we're talking here though and, and circle back, if that's okay. Yeah, that's all I have, thank you. And Mayor Kerr. Yes, Mr. Siegel. Isn't the outfall, it's it's not user fees, it's it's FEMA funds, but that's not classified as grants or or how do we classify that? Yeah, so in this in these charts here, those are classified as user fees. And um, here I'll I'll share this again. I, I know it's a bit it's a bit confusing. Um, so this 30 million right here, this 20 million of that would be, um, it is coming from the sewer fund. Uh, we initially, when we put this together, uh, we identified all of that as, um, well, we identified it as rates and user fees, even though it's, um, a lot of that is gonna be coming from a bond issue. It's debt, uh, the debt service will be paid by rates and user fees. Um, since we put this draft together, we have identified additional grant revenue 
here. Bear with me for just a moment. Um, so this is <clears throat> this is going back to our annual budget worksheet, which I apologize. I should have refreshed this before our meeting started. Um, but looking at the at the revenues and scrolling down. Scrolling down to the sewer fund. So GFC is 972,000. 6.5 in user fees. Um, this, inter this line here, interlocal grants, entitlements, et cetera, at 10 million, that's uh, where we are budgeting the FEMA grant. And um, the rest of that is going to be coming out of uh, cash reserves, which is not illustrated here. And so Steve, weren't we told that the FEMA grant could be as much as 20? Never mind. Yes, that's been um, a number that's been hard to, to nail down to this point. Um, okay. I've heard a variety of, of, of estimates, including up to um, $20 million. So we have, we currently have uh, nearly $10 million left over from the bond issue that was done in October of 2020. And that money is scheduled to be used for the outfall project unless that FEMA grant comes in at a higher level. If, for example, that FEMA grant came in and paid for the entire $20 million project, the way the bond ordinance was structured allows us to use those bond proceeds on other projects that, that council would approve. So other okay. things that we have in the CFP could be funded with those, uh, those bond proceeds. So I, I think this answers some of Mr. Wilkinson's questions, but I understand why it is confusing if you're just looking at it as a, someone that isn't, you know, knowledgeable about the budget. Are here? Mr. Wilkinson. Well, one of Mr. Wilkinson's questions from way back when was identification of the park to be constructed at the end of U Avenue mm -hmm. um, as a component of the outfall project. And maybe there's a reason not to include it, but I thought that we'd talked about in, including it in the description of the project because it's mitigation for the tearing up of the street and the substantial impact on the neighborhood that that uh, project will cause. Um, but we don't have the, the document in front of us to look at that. And I, th I think that drives home some of the reason to make sure that we've got the document in front of us to look at. We also want the document to be adopted as part of the ordinance. Um, but also cleaning up some of the the descriptions of the ways that the projects are funded is important because so for example on the on the chart we've got um, we've got user fees and we've got debt but debt always has to be paid back so debt is generally going to be user fees too right um, it, it's just user fees over a greater period of time and and so I, I'm sort of wondering how it is we represent that in the document um, and how we make sure that we're we're tracking that and not getting us into a situation where we've spent so much on projects that we then have to increase a utility rate unexpectedly um, because we don't have enough money for the next important project. And um, concomitant with that, we've got to be thinking in terms of the, the capacity projects and the ones that aren't capacity projects. And by capacity, I mean um, required to operate the system or provide for future growth. And now this, the sewer outfall project is a capacity project because our capacity goes to zero if the <laughs> sewer outfall doesn't work and we've currently got a problem with it. Um, but some of the other projects, um, you know, re replacement of, of water meters or, or things like that, are those capacity or not? We, we ought to have clarity from Public Works, I think, on those. 
And we also ought to have clarity on whether we're authorizing that project as part of the capital facilities plan. I, I think we really need to so that staff have direction on which way to go. But that means I don't want to include a project that we're not sure about uh, the need or the, or the desire to spend the money on it. Um, some of the other projects, so for instance, we, we did talk about um, removing the Safe Routes to School project that was in there because uh, that grant opportunity is apparently not going to be available, uh, which makes sense, right? If, 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 if a project depends on a grant and we're not sure that we're going to get the grant and there's no alternative funding, then we probably shouldn't include the project in the, in the, in the capital facilities plan. But on the other hand, shouldn't we also be making some decisions about things that we need to do that we don't have money for so that we tell staff to go find the money? You know, like connecting sidewalks, uh, that don't currently exist, building these safe routes. I mean, if we have a safe routes to school need, then we ought to identify that need, put it in the plan, and if, it does, if, if we identify it as a capacity need, then we must find the money. Um, if it's a, more of a nice to have, then it should still be on the list, and we should be telling staff to go, go find money for it. Um, I think on some level this, this still requires some reimagining of how we've constructed uh, the capital facilities plan to um, achieve, achieve those goals of making sure that we're providing the capital facilities that are necessary to support development, which is what the statute tells us to do, um, with clearly identified sources of, of money. Grants, like the, the FEMA sewer grant, is highly likely um, for us to get that. So maybe that's worthy of listing that as an actual funding source in the project. But anything that's further out, if it's a grant and we don't actually know we're going to get it, then we need to th be thinking in other terms. We shouldn't be listing. And if it, went, if it had to go to the Growth Management Hearings Board for appeal, it would not be sufficient for us to say, well, we're going to get a grant for that capacity project. Uh, we would have to identify real sources of, of available money to fund those projects. Um, so I, I think that once we've got the, the revised document in front of us, we've got still a pretty in-depth conversation that we need to have about how to proceed. Any other comments? Rima. Yeah, Mayor Gare. Um, switching gears, if it's okay, about the just the actual 2022 budget. Um, Last week, Chief Floyd came and made some comments and uh, made a request for an additional officer for a, a general crimes detective um, and talked about uh, the added kind of the, the fact that some of the we, we're at a, a lower um, um, staffing level than what the uh, our strategic plan uh, expects for the size of the population, and that's a discussion that he'd like to have, I think, in the next year, but that right now one additional officer would make a, a large impact on just uh, dealing with some of the type of crimes that they're dealing with right now, and especially the digital, digital forensics and the amount of time and energy it takes to do that component of most crimes. Um, so I would like, if there's a possibility of talking about if there's money in the budget to do that and, and how that would work into our budget for next week too. That would be a nice addition for us to have a discussion, further discussion okay. on. Okay, so we've, we've switched to budget now. So um, council, other things you would like to have clarified to bring forward next November 7th, the budget. Questions, clarifications? Mayor Gear. Mr. Walters. Um, it, it's not obvious when you read through the budget, but if, it, if it's true that Parks is funding staff out of uh, reserves, it seems to me that that probably violates one of our financial policies, um, which is to not fund ongoing expenses um, with one-time revenues. Um, so I, I think we ought to talk a little bit more about that. And we, we talked a little bit in the Finance Committee how there are two departments, the library and the parks department, that are general revenue funded departments, but they have their own reserves because they have their own fund. And other departments aren't like that. They don't have their own funds, they don't have their own reserves. And if the city were in a situation where 
It had to spend heavily out of reserves because of some unexpected shortfall or disaster or something like that. Seems to me that we ought to make holistic decisions about how to spend reserves, but simply because it's always been this way, we have two departments that are set up in their own funds that have their own reserves, and under the rules, we can't just spend other funds' reserves on projects outs or, or expenses outside of that fund. So I think that's a fundamental thing, not something that we have to fix this year, but we ought to be talking about. Um, I'm, I'm not in favor of, of, of uh, not allowing the Parks Department to fund that position, but we need to do it in a way that makes sense consistent with our own rules. Um, and maybe we, maybe we should talk about the, those financial policies too and whether there might be some exceptions that make sense. It's a larger discussion than maybe just the, this year's budget, but we don't generally have those discussions outside of the budget process, so got to hit it sometime. Other questions, Council? On the budget. And so, um, and then Steve, you have notes from last week on questions that were asked for the budget, or were there any? Okay. Yeah, um, in fact, I'm gonna, um, I have some time the next couple of days. Um, it gives us a, a little more preparation time without a council meeting coming up next right. Monday. So I'll go back, revisit last week's um, recording and, and okay. you know, make okay. sure we're, we're capturing all those comments. Because yeah, I'd like to be able to bring all this to the council on the 7th so they can um, feel comfortable moving forward with the CFP and the budget. Okay, anything else for the discussion this evening? So, um, at this time, we are going to go into executive session. And I will read that again for what we're doing. And first of all, I want to thank Officer Little, retired Officer Little, for being with us this evening. He came out as far as the budget and supported the police. So I appreciate you spending the time with us. It's good to see you. Yeah. All right. So at this time, the city council and the city attorney will now meet in executive session to discuss potential litigation or litigation as allowed by RCW 42.030.110. The city council will be in executive session for approximately 30 minutes from this time, which is um, just about 7.30. At the conclusion of executive session, the regular meeting will be adjourned and no action will be taken. All right, we will retire to 